And China has lashed out at a $52 billion program to expand American chip making, saying the landmark blueprint contains elements that violate fair market practice principles and targets Beijing's own efforts to build a semiconductor industry. The U.S. Chips Act signed into law this month and part of an overall package of incentives worth in excess of $200 billion is intended to give China's rivals a helping hand, said Yu Zhikang, vice chairman of the China Semiconductor Industry Association. Now, South Korea is planning to block domestic access to foreign currency exchanges that lack the proper registration to operate in the country and could launch a probe into those companies. An intelligence unit of the Financial Services Commission has reported 16 foreign crypto businesses to the nation's investigative body and asked other agencies to block access to the firm's local website, according to a statement on Thursday. The statement listed the companies such as uh, KuCoin, MECX, Femex, XT.com, Bitru, ZB.com, BitGlobal, CoinW, CoinX, AAX, ZoomX, Poloniex, BTSEX, BTCC, DigiPhoenix, and Pionex. For more on these headlines, we have joined Ninos now, Efosa Louis. He's the head of investment at uh, Sankore Global. Uh, good afternoon to you, and it's good to have you here this uh, Friday. So uh, let's start Absolutely. with the tech stocks over the week. We go to the home of uh, for tech stocks in the world. That's Nasdaq. Down 17 year, 17 percent year to date, and it's also down roughly one percent in early trading today. Are tech stocks still under pressure? Well, I think that you know, just coming off the minutes of the Fed that was released on Wednesday, and, and the fact that um, you know those minutes essentially re-echoed the hawkish stance that the Fed has, um, you know, pretty pretty much maintained, you know, uh, for the better part of this year. Uh, that has taken some steam, uh, basically, out of the broader market, really, and so much so for for the tech sector, which typically comes under significantly more pressure as um, interest rates continue to rise. But um, I, I think that there have been, you know, uh, a clear, you know, sentiments around the fact that the Federal Reserve was, you know, going to slow down on the pace of hikes, and that had created um, a sort of a bounce that we had seen since the middle of, uh, of of June. I mean, for for context. Uh, like you said, the Nasdaq is uh, up, is down up seventeen uh, percent year to date. However, if you if you looked at that number in the middle of June, it was down about thirty two percent. So essentially, it's been able to claw back about twenty one percent of um, you know that downside uh, since the middle of June. And, and same goes for uh, you know major tech stocks. Uh, you look at Tesla, you look at Microsoft, you look at Apple, and you look at Google. Uh, they've been, Tesla has been able to claw back about forty four percent. Microsoft has claw back about eighteen percent. Apple has taken back about thirty three. Percent Google is back up about twelve percent. You know, so we've seen a semblance of a recovery. Um, you know, since the middle of June. However, you know, the recent uh, minutes released by the Fed essentially re-echoing um, its hawkish stance has basically taken some steam. Um, you know, out of the recent market momentum that we have seen. Uh, interesting. If we take the uh, the tech talk straight to the Fed Reserve officials, some of them are forecasting more rate hike. Well, what's the outlook for U.S. stocks if the Fed, uh, the FOMC, remain very hawkish as as it's been? I think the issue really is around how hawkish the, the FOMC would be. Um, really and truly, we're essentially looking to the next CPI print to kind of give us a sense or some sort of guidance as to how hawkish the Fed would be. Recall that uh, we are just coming off the bounce of a 75 basis points back-to-back -back hike. Uh, question really is whether the Fed will maintain that sort of pace of hike or will come down a bit on it. I mean, the last CPI print we saw, uh, essentially saw uh, you know headline inflation come down to about 8.5%. If we see uh, a continuous drop to maybe around 8.2, 8.3, uh, that could provide impetus for the Fed to probably, um, you know, reduce the pace of hikes. However, if we see inflation sticky, uh, it could create a situation where the Federal Reserve, um, you know, continues with a 75 basis point hike. We call that, you know, you know, the Fed has essentially been late in trying to rein in inflation. So uh, it becomes kind of critical that they basically sort of front load uh, with the sort of hawkishness that they, they are, they are trying to put forward now to ensure that inflation is actually raining. So I, I still see, um, you know, further rate hikes down the road. Uh, I think the question really is around the pace of those rate hikes, which I believe will be largely determined by what happens with the CPI print going forward. Okay, let's talk about uh, China's negative reaction to the $52 billion U.S. Chips Act. Does it make sense that China will feel threatened 
by the semiconductor investment by the Americans. The, you think this is a semiconductor? The game is on. Well, I mean, the truth of the matter is that, you know, semiconductors really hold the key to a lot of things in the future. Um, they are used in all of the high-tech uh, gadgets that we've got today and all of the high-tech gadgets, you know, going into the future. So for the U.S., this is essentially, a, if you will, a national security move. Um, if, you, if, you, if you look at, you know, what, what's happening now, the U.S. is essentially accounting for less than 12% of global microchip or semiconductor production. In the 90s, the U.S. accounted for about 37% of that number. Now, to make matters worse, uh, Taiwan is essentially the major or the global hub for semiconductor production, accounts for over 90% of production. If you look at it from a geopolitical standpoint, uh, you know, the whole geopolitical tension with China regarding to Taiwan off the back of Nancy Pelosi's visit a couple of weeks ago uh, is creating a situation where the United States has to make certain national security moves to ensure that there are no disruptions in case uh, tensions significantly ratchet up from where they are. And that's what the U.S. is doing. I mean, understandably, China will certainly feel threatened by this. But again, if you look at China, what has happened so far is that um, it, they have deployed close to about 80 billion in subsidies for semiconductor productions locally in China of a $150 billion plan. So there are subsidies also going on in China. But however, I think that, you know, the U.S. technologically still has certain uh, advantages or edge, you know, where it has basically banned the, um, you know, shipping of some key elements uh, that go into the manufacturing of these semiconductors to China. So China obviously is protesting and obviously looking at the, the, the trajectory going forward, it will significantly limit, um, you know, China's uh, control, dominance and ability to compete going forward. Uh, China, suffice it to say, has uh, just about 4% of the global semiconductors market. Uh, so do you think uh, this uh, U.S. Chiefs Act is, could just be the catalyst for the United States to start producing semiconductors back at home? That's the whole idea, really. I mean, at the end of the day, like I said earlier, the U.S. was producing about 37% of, global, of the global semiconductor market in the 90s, and that has dropped quite significantly. So it's basically looking to claw that back. So that, um, you know, Chips and Science Act that was signed earlier this week uh, basically just puts out um, about $52 billion in aid to investors that are going to situate chip manufacturing facilities in the United States. It's also going to tap about $200 billion in research spending over the next 10 years. So clearly, this is a strategic plan by the United States to position itself as a top, you know, manufacturer of semiconductors going forward. And, you know, it just makes sense, really, for, for the U.S. to do that. Uh, Taiwan is the industry leader of the global semiconductor industry. Uh, so, with the Taiwan Semiconductor uh, Manufacturing Company holding 54% share, do you think the Americans can, can catch up with the Asians? I mean, it's certainly going to take some time. Uh, this move is a step in the right direction. And, and clearly, part of this move, really, honestly, is to try and curb you know, uh, China's influence, is to try and, try and curb, uh, if you will, the rise of China. And this, again, has been further exacerbated by the recent, um, you know, fair enough of tensions uh, between the U.S. and China over Taiwan. Um, you know, so again, you, you can't have that kind of strategic commodity being produced by a country that could be under threat. Um, you know, and, and that's the reason has, uh, the United States uh, has, um, you know, made this move. Uh, let's talk about Qualcomm. Uh, what do you make of the decision of uh, the company to return to the cyber markets with a new chip? What's the big deal there? Well, I think it's, uh, for me, I think this is a strategic pivot. Um, you know, in the wake of the whole COVID uh, pandemic, you know, the, the expectation is that uh, the shipments or the growth in the smartphone market will drop uh, about 5% this year. Uh, Qualcomm is the second largest maker of, um, you know, smartphone chips, and that's its major market. That market accounts for more than half of Qualcomm's revenue. So that's a significant, um, you know, market for it. So it, it's important that as that market, you know, starts to face challenges with, um, you know, a dwindling in, you know, smartphone demand and smartphone shipments going into the next couple of years, uh, it is important that Qualcomm starts to look at other markets. And, and I think that, you know, looking at the server market or making chips for the server market is, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really good pivot. I mean, that market right now is dominated by a duopoly between Intel and IMD. So, uh, you know, Qualcomm coming, coming into that market with the competency that it has and has displayed in the smartphone market will certainly board well for it. I mean, recall that, um, you know, uh, Amazon Web Services has indicated interest in looking at the offering. So uh, I, I think it's just a strategic pivot to basically diversify its uh, revenue base, if you will. Uh, and I think it's a step in the right direction. 
Uh, Efosa Aluye, Head Investment at Sankore Global. Thank you so much for your time. Enjoy your weekend and see you next time here on the show.